This video is sponsored by NordVPN. 2022 has been a pretty good year for video games. The AAA selection was better than last year, but indies just kept on killing it as per usual, and even continued to break into the mainstream more and more. I played a little under 40 games this year, although admittedly most were from older platforms. That's not to say I didn't enjoy any newer titles, otherwise this video would not exist. I have a mix of well-known and more obscure games I want to talk about, and I'll try to describe them in a way that will be relevant to their target audience, while gushing about my favourite games. Each title in this list offers something different, and personally I naturally gravitate towards variety and can't really play the same genre again and again. So whether or not you're like me, I'm sure there's at least one game in here that will interest you. I won't have a specific order for most of this list, since I love them all fairly equally, but I will leave my top three until the end. So without further ado, here are 10 games I played in 2022 that were cool. Sifu is a martial arts game that came out near the start of the year, but even back then I knew it would be one of my favourites. Each death will age you, with the years following you to the next level encouraging you to replay them if you feel that you died too many times, as getting past 70 will end your run. I'm usually put off by these kinds of mechanics, but Sifu's ageing system felt fair and motivating for me. There's definitely a rhythm to the fighting that can take quite a few hours to grasp, but once it clicks you enter an extremely satisfying flow state. Learning the boss's moveset wasn't too difficult, and responding to their different rhythms became second nature to me. I loved the gameplay so much I perfected almost every level with zero death runs, and beat the entire game under 25 years of age. This is easier and quicker than it sounds, as finding certain items in later levels can unlock more shortcuts in earlier areas. You can also get buffs at shrines throughout the levels, so finding those can really help with things like dealing more structure damage on your opponent for instance. The skill tree available provides a good selection of moves you can unlock with XP for your current run, or purchase permanently for future runs too by buying it 5 times. The skills you can get are dependent on your character's age, with some being locked out after you get too old. So that's another incentive to play levels again and again to keep your useful new combat moves. There's even the extra challenge of sparing bosses, which will require you to break a boss's structure twice, as opposed to killing them, which only requires one structure break. Doing so will get you a different ending too. I'm not really someone who cares too much about being that good at a game, but there was something so rewarding in mastering Sifu's fighting that I couldn't help but put in the hours to actually become pretty skilled. If you're willing to take the time to learn it, the game is very fulfilling to play. Sifu's got a clean yet textured art style that is visually pleasing, but not at the detriment of its clarity. If anything, it helps enemies stand out, and its stylization, unlike its main character, won't ever age. As an admirer of Sam Barlow's Her Story and Telling Lies, I of course had to play his latest title, Immortality. This game is about unravelling the mysterious disappearance of Marissa Marcel, an accomplished actress whose three films never seen the light of day. Expanding upon gameplay from Barlow's previous titles, Immortality tasks you with pouring over footage from three entire films, along with the rehearsal and location scouting footage. However, you aren't searching by just typing in keywords, but instead using the match cut feature to uncover new footage with similar imagery to whatever you click on. As you scrub through the decades of footage, you piece together the puzzle of what happened to Marissa and the cast and crew of these films. Arguably the best part of the whole experience is finding the hidden scenes, which gives a new layer to the game's narrative while also serving as some of the creepiest parts of the game. Unlike her story and telling lies however, immortality will require a lot more thinking to figure out who certain characters are and what they represent especially when it comes to the hidden videos. At times, searching for and uncovering footage can feel like a labyrinthine task, but I could not stop myself from trying to find those leads, painstakingly examining every frame I could. I played this game from start to finish on the day it was released, which took me about 5 hours. I didn't unlock all the footage available, but still got a full grasp on the events that transpired 
and the chills I got from finding the last footage of Marissa were unforgettable. If you're looking for a story-rich game you won't be able to tear yourself away from, Immortality will pull you in like nothing else. Growing My Grandpa is a short game sitting between 1-2 to two hours for full completion, and it's a perfectly eerie experience for an evening after work. Sometimes I want to play games that don't need much commitment, but still offer me a fulfilling playthrough despite their shorter playtime. So if you're looking for a surreal little treat, you're going to want to check this one out. The most simple way of describing it is equating it to the creepy fake point and click game videos made by Molly Moon, but with a virtual pet twist. It's a disturbing yet kind of sweet tale of a girl trying to grow her late grandpa in the basement of his old home that she and her parents have recently moved into. You'll find yourself cleaning trash and picking up documents, food, and words to teach grandpa. The otherworldly ambient soundtrack of the game perfectly accompanies you through your weeks with grandpa as you feed him and teach him basic communication. <laughs> I don't want to go too deep into the story and what you uncover in the basement, so I'll speak more on the incredible atmosphere instead. The FMV-inspired visuals with their choppy nature are unsettling yet nostalgic, and even the text wobbles and writhes as if alive and mutating. Throughout the game, you'll feel more uneasy as your knowledge of what you're raising grows alongside Grandpa, but the sense of the unknown never leaves you. It's a wonderfully strange body horror point and click game that is simple in its gameplay, but is one of the most unique titles you can play this year. Especially after playing a lot of more tense games back to back, I crave a game that is light and casual like a collectathon. So I picked up Tinykin looking for this exact kind of experience, and it did not disappoint. It's a 3D platformer with Pikmin like creatures you use to traverse the environments and solve puzzles. The levels are all based in a domestic space, with you and your tinykin jumping, climbing, and sliding around different rooms of a house while shrunken down to the size of a little bug. The rooms are large and open, but impressively packed with so many different obstacles that will require a certain number of a particular tinykin variety, each used for their own skill. Some will help you lift heavy objects, others will stack so you can climb them, or some will even conduct an electrical current to help switch on electronics. It has a Paper Mario inspired aesthetic, as characters are like 2D paper cutouts, but the objects and structures around you are 3D. It's not a challenging game to play through normally, but getting 100% on each level will mean you have to put in quite a bit of effort since you're not given any equipment to help scope out collectibles or tinykin. It's all dependent on your ability to explore every nook and cranny thoroughly, which does mean a fair bit of patience is essential. There's something about collectathons and even achievement lists for games in general that I just love to switch off my brain for and enjoy. Having that big project for 100% be broken down into doable tasks, and slowly checking them off my list before the final Platinum Trophy pop gives me a rush of dopamine, even more so when the game I'm playing is as charming as Tinykin. The rhythm first-person shooter genre is one I never knew I would be so enamoured by until I played Metal Hellsinger. It features vocals by some of the most beloved artists in the metal genre, and I'm not a metalhead by any means, so I only recognised a couple of them. But the music was so powerful, it had me feeling unstoppable. I can only imagine how hyped this game is for people who listen to heavy metal, but don't be deterred even if you don't. The game has you making your way through the infernal plains of hell, fighting hordes of demons. Each weapon will require you to follow a different beat to match the song for maximum points but you will also need to reload and dash at the right time too. Doing so will keep up a streak, and with each multiplayer the music becomes more intense, with the vocals only kicking in when you're on the max multiplier. This in itself is the best reward for playing well, making you feel like the coolest person in the world when you become in sync with the beat, especially when you hit those slaughter kills that pack an extra punch. This is definitely one to play with headphones. The game has main levels with a linear format, but it also gives you arena-based optional challenges to test your skills. I couldn't get enough of the game, so I beat all the levels and challenges offered, which came to a total of 6 hours of playtime. 
The quality of gameplay is insane, the visuals are great and the music is perfect. It's no wonder Metal Hellsinger has high reviews across the board. I have to say right off the bat that Scorn is one of those games that is unfortunately hard to market. It had a similar response to Death Stranding's release where a lot of people expected one thing and got something completely different, which obviously led to disappointment for some. I followed Scorn's trailers and development quite closely, so I already knew this was going to be a puzzle game with a heavy emphasis on the world's architecture. But showing things like puzzles in trailers is a bit tricky, seeing that you want to keep as much under wraps as possible for players to enjoy firsthand themselves. Because of that, most of what was shown was the light combat elements in Scorn, which a lot of people assumed meant that the game was a shooter. Despite the fact that one of the trailers literally has the words, Scorn is not a shooter. That being said, the right audience is starting to find the game, so I'm glad that's happening at least. I've described Scorn to my friends as a fleshy mist, which I promise you is more accurate than you might think. It's a very gross, nightmarish game that may make you feel queasy at times, but in the most beautifully revolting way possible. The landscapes and structures inspired by Giga and Bekshinsky are superb, so if you ever wanted to know what it would be like to walk through a painting of their work, Scorn is more than good enough for that alone. I couldn't even count how many times I audibly gasped at the sight of some of the most wonderful virtual spaces I've ever laid my eyes upon. In terms of its narrative atmosphere, I'd say Scorn is somewhat similar to I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, where there's lots of existential dread, suffering, and hopelessness. It's a very cruel game thematically, but with its dark exploration of technology and our relation to it, it makes sense that flesh and machinery become one and the same. There's no dialogue and barely any user interface, which really showcases the wonderful animations as well as the inventory display system. Overall, Scorn is a dark cinematic and gory experience that will be something really special for the right player. As a prolific cat person, it would be a crime if Stray was not on this list. It's a simple game mechanically, which allows your focus to fall upon world building and presentation. Its environments include an organised mess of objects and junk. Every shelf is bustling with belongings and decor. Floors are laden with soft rugs and walls are plastered in worn down wallpaper and posters. Each home is a believable living space, and it's heartwarming that the robots so carefully take care of their humble abodes. They can even be found wearing cosy clothes and huddling up in blankets, sporting their happiness on their screens as you rub up against their legs. It's all a very wholesome experience, one that relies on the characters and their relationships, as well as unravelling what happened to all the humans. There's no shortage of stunning sights to gaze upon, from lovingly crafted urban environments packed with graffiti and neon lights, to vibrant overgrowth in the unlikeliest of places. Safe from its chase sequences, Stray's experience is ultimately serene and comforting. It even offers the most realistic depiction of cat behaviour I've ever seen, and the player can indulge in meowing, scratching, and napping at their heart's content. A really cool part of playing Stray on PC means that modding is a possibility, so if you're a cat owner or there's a certain breed that means a lot to you, you can change the appearance of the protagonist to match your favourite furry friend. Personally, I played the game on PS5, so didn't get a chance to play as my cats, but I did appreciate the use of haptic feedback on the controller. For example, when taking a nap, the camera will slowly move outward while your controller simulates purring. It's absolutely adorable, and reminds me of my favourite mechanical feature in Death Stranding. Playing Stray felt like medicine to me. I was pretty stressed out with life stuff around the time of its release, and it was definitely there for me at the right time. At first glance of Citizen Sleeper's screenshots, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get into it. I often struggle with text-heavy games and rarely ever finish them, but given its impressively high review scores and the fact that my friend gifted it to me, I thought I'd give it a shot. And considering it's made it to this list, you already know how that turned out. Citizen Sleeper is a narrative RPG set on a dilapidated space station, home to many struggling to survive, including you. 
your character's body is slowly breaking down, so obtaining the resources you need to survive the next cycle is key. Each cycle you're given a number of dice which can be used to perform certain actions. Whether or not they're successful depends on the value of the dice and your character's skill set, which you shape through levelling them up. The quests available in the game introduce you to a cast of characters that you can't help but want to learn more about, regardless of whether they're friend or foe. I took part in every one I could, slowly feeling at home in this community and navigating it with ease and efficiency. The hours I had with this game flew by without me noticing. I think the reason I was completely immersed in the game world, other than its incredible writing, was because of the soundtrack. It evokes feelings of mechanical coldness, a harsh cyberpunk world of simultaneous struggle and hope. It made me envision tangled cables and urban grit, repeating lines of intelligible code and rusted technology, a gentle touch of humanity within it all. I cannot even stress how well the music complemented the experience of Citizen Sleeper. It helped my brain effortlessly turn the words into vivid images, sounds, and smells. I could even imagine the thickness of the air of the place I was in. I was never really able to get into popular cyberpunk media. I struggled to break down the common themes, and the aesthetic was never presented in a way that I truly loved and connected with. But Citizen Sleeper unlocked something within me, and I think that's the highest praise I can give it. The fact that it's opened doors for me to enjoy new things that I previously never could have means so much to me. I think there's a few games and movies that kind of led up to me falling in love with cyberpunk, but Citizen Sleeper gave me the final kick I needed. I'm sure nobody is surprised by this choice at all considering I made a 30 minute video raving about it, but Elden Ring is a very close second for my favourite game of the year. I won't speak for too long on this since I've exhausted all of my thoughts on it in said video, so I'll just summarise. Elden Ring is a phenomenal game, with an open world so jaw-droppingly detailed that you can't help but feel in awe of it. FromSoft clearly put a lot of thought into this aspect too, inserting some of the most stunning landscape views I've seen in a virtual world, or to be stumbled upon at your own pace. The tried and true Soulsborne gameplay is as good as ever, accompanied by a wonderful selection of armour and clothing pieces to accessorise your character with. The freedom provided to the player via customization, combat style, and the seemingly endless paths through the lands between gives the game a real sense of grandeur. Its world and many of its bosses feel dynamic, inhabiting the impressive variation of environments the game has to offer. Without a doubt, Elden Ring has already made its mark on the history of gaming, appealing to both longtime FromSoft fans and newcomers alike. It's one of the few video games in recent years that truly felt next-gen to me, given the sheer scale of its world. There are other open-world games with huge overworlds, but there's just something about the immensity of Elden Ring's underground that adds even more depth to its already breathtaking overworld. I felt such a deep connection to my journey through the Lands Between that gave me so many great memories. It's a staple in the dark fantasy genre. Signalis is probably going to be on a lot of top games lists this year, and for good reason. I was lucky enough to have been gifted an early key by the developer, and it was so difficult keeping how good the game was to myself until the embargo was lifted. It was a title I've had my eyes on for years, and it was an honour to play it. You know when a game caters to your preferences so well you can't help but feel like it was made for you? Yeah, that was Signalis for me. Survival horror is my favourite genre ever, but it's one that often struggles to be done well in the modern day, save for a few releases every year. Signalis is my favourite survival horror title in a long, long time. Its stellar visual presentation includes pixel art cutscenes, low-poly retro-futuristic environments, and technological interfaces with all its pixelated typography and error codes. It's stylistically one of the most impressive games I've ever played, Overall, if the words sci-fi Silent Hill interest you, then I can assure you that you won't be disappointed with this title. Signalis plays like a classic survival horror game. Its combat, or lack of thereof depending on your playstyle, is responsive and allows for ample variation. But the gameplay's most impressive aspect is its puzzles. 
There's a few different tools for puzzle solving aside from simply finding a key for a door. And I personally love making notes on paper or taking photos in order to remember a code or pattern for future use. There's even an in-game item that will allow you to record certain sites to refer to later for this exact purpose. Not only does Signalis succeed in being one of the best survival horror games, it's also one that does cosmic horror incredibly well. The intense, looming nature of the unknown simmers in the underbelly of the game's atmosphere. Slowly you're able to pick apart what's happening, but that feeling of facing something inexplicable never really goes away. Some parts remain incomprehensible and obscure for good reason. Signalis's approach to storytelling is one that will involve you piecing things together yourself, but its overarching themes sink into your mind both consciously and subconsciously. The gameplay is accompanied by a haunting soundtrack that elaborates on the pain and beauty of both love and grief. Many of its songs are entrancingly bittersweet, like fragmented, fading memories of happier times that deteriorate as time callously moves on. Very few titles feel like they've captured everything I want in a game as well as affected me so deeply. My time with Signalis will stick with me for many years to come, and I can confidently say that it's my game of the year for 2022. Now for a word from today's sponsor, NordVPN. Your passwords are the most precious part of your online information being your first line of defense for your accounts. Unfortunately, the use of simple passwords or the same one across multiple platforms makes you vulnerable to hackers. Having the password Eurothug4000 is the best YouTuber123 on multiple sites will have your accounts compromised very quickly, since this would definitely be a hacker's first guess. But thanks to NordVPN's dark web monitor feature, you can get alerts about your credentials that appear on underground websites. You can even use the free NordPass password manager to generate and automatically fill in strong passwords. With NordVPN, you can also buy games that are only available in other countries by changing your virtual location too. You're able to access discounts in other regions as well as geo-restricted servers with 59 countries to choose from. So don't let your location limit where you can play. It takes just a few seconds to select a new location and connect. By using NordVPN, you can avoid DDoS attacks that significantly slow down your connection and block malware-ridden websites. By using my link on screen and in the description, you can get a huge discount with the purchase of a two-year plan with four additional months free. Get the exclusive NordVPN deal at nordvpn.com forward slash Eurothug4000. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. A big thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Every game in this list was there exactly when I needed it, meaning there's a few widely acclaimed games that came out this year that aren't in this video, purely because I didn't feel like playing them at the time. I may play them in a few years and enjoy them, but I won't force myself to play a game I know I'm not in the mood for. It helps me appreciate them fully when I do finally decide to give them a go, and doesn't make me despise a puzzle title because I played it when I was craving a first-person shooter. I'm super happy with the titles I've played and chosen for this list, so please let me know if you end up trying one of them. I also have a creator link in the description for GOG's platform, so if you buy any of the games from there, I get a little cut. This year has been pretty difficult for me, and I really wish I had more time and energy to put out more videos. Turns out balancing full-time work and content creation isn't that easy. That being said, I've had some of the best performing releases for videos in 2022. I worked with Red Bull and had my first sponsorships. Not to mention, I'm almost at 75k subs as of writing this, which is wild, and I really can't thank everyone enough. I figured out the kind of direction I want to go in with my channel, and I have so many video ideas for next year that I'm excited to make. Twitch streaming has been fun too, and I've become a lot more confident with it, which is really cool. So if you want to come hang out, you can find me there about once a week. There's plenty of amazing games that are coming out in 2023 and beyond. So just like last year's video, here's a montage of what to look forward to.
I want to give a huge thank you to my lovely patrons who have made it possible for me to invest in this channel, with the new capture card, mic, and commissions this year. I can't even explain how grateful I am that people give me financial support to keep getting better at this whole content creation thing, so I'm always trying my best to improve and make things people will enjoy. I hope you all have a wonderful new year, and thanks again for your support.